two weeks. That's what it took me to create a online multiplayer ML API Ludo game without proper API knowledge. Why did it take so long? Uh, I went into it really, really confident that I would be able to pick up the API on stream and I really looked like an idiot for most of the time. The reason is because MLAPI has a couple of little twists that you need to know before you jump into it um, or you're gonna have to discover after a two hour session of debugging. This video right here is a must watch. If you plan on picking up the MLAPI and you still don't, you haven't played with it before, you don't know these little quirks that I'm about to mention, watch this video completely. It's worth it, I promise. You're gonna save like eight hours of debugging minimum. And hopefully by the end you can pick up some useful knowledge uh, for working with this API. And if you do, please leave me a like, really appreciate it. Helps the channel out quite a lot actually. The engagement is now the main source of traffic on, on YouTube. So please drop a like, subscribe because soon on Sunday this week, as I'm going to be doing the live stream, I'm going to be releasing this code for everybody. So the, the code is going to be on my GitLab. It's already on my GitLab, but I'm pushing the update with the completed code on Sunday Eastern. And uh, yeah, so subscribe. Remote procedure calls, or RPC, they're quite handy. They allow you to broadcast a function call to one or all the client. And you can also call something on the server from a single client. So I could say something such as, hey, I'm a client and I'd like to roll the dice. So dice roll server RPC and this code will now be run on the server. So this is all server code that will be, that is actually being called from a client. They even have an example right here in the documentation project, the Hello World project from the MLAPI documentation. They have an example of a submit position request, which as a client, you would call this from the client side. This would be run on the server side to reposition your object. This was because the server is the one that would move you. You're not allowed to move. The server is moving you. So it's a authoritative server. And um, this would actually move the right value. So quite cool. Now the question is, why is my specific RPC flow not doing anything? I'm not getting any server. Let me explain. I have a dice roll button. This is being called on every single client, right? So as a client, when it's my turn, I can press on the dice roll button, which would then call the dice roll server RPC. And for some reason, this code was never run. It didn't even enter here if I was to put the debug.log or anything. Now both of these function, both the RPC and also my button, both of these are on my game manager object. So my game manager object, it's right here at the top. It's a network behavior and it's a big object that pretty much controls all of the board. Basically, this is all the logic is in this. Well, it turns out that you can only call RPCs on object that you have the ownership of. And as a client, I do not own my game manager. Therefore, my RPC won't go through. So luckily for us, there is a parameter we can pass in to make sure that the calls go through even though we are not the owner of the same object. So with the require ownership false, we can now run this from, from any client really. And unfortunately for me, there is nowhere in the documentation where I can find information about this. So nowhere in the client RPC server RPC, nothing like that. However, there was one statement, once I actually knew about that, uh, there is one place where we can find it and it's under the API server RPC attribute is at the very end. And you can find here whether or not server RPC should be run if executed by the owner of the object. So by default, this value is true. This value makes it so you can only run an RPC on the same ownership object. My second problem was more of a logic issue, something that didn't really click in my head initially, and it had to do with network transform behavior. The network transform is a component that will synchronize your position on both the client and the server. It will basically make sure that your object is synchronized to move in the world and everybody else will receive its new position. So during the making of the game, I wanted every player to own their own pieces. So if they were to drop out, the pieces would also drop out with them, they would disappear. But the whole logic behind the board is hidden behind on the server. This way the client can't hack the role or their logical position on the board. So this means that you cannot change the network position of an object that isn't yours, which is totally fine, right? So you're, you wouldn't be able to move the player one player if you're the player two. So you don't wanna be able to move somebody else objects. However, what I found out is that even as a server or a host, you cannot move transform either. You really have to be the one that owns it. So instead, I had to call an RPC on the specific client 
and this one had to move and I've sent him a position so he could update himself. Then the change would be reflected on all the connected machines. So the Ludo game has a dice roll, which would mean that every time it's somebody's turn, they roll the dice and they can get a number in between 1 and 6. And I wanted this dice value to be networked so everybody could see what uh, this specific person has rolled, for example. So if player 1 rolled a 6, I wanted to make sure that everybody saw that he rolled a 6. So I networked this value, therefore the value was being uh, propagated to everybody else every time it changed. And it worked really well initially, so I started hooking the whole flow of my game around that. I would wait for somebody to roll the dice, and when that person rolled the dice, I would fire an event based on the event, uh, the unchanged event. So if my value had changed in the network, I would fire an event and then the flow of the game would continue. But as I was testing more and more, I realized that some of the time, um, the game would get stuck. And it would get stuck because I would roll a dice with, for example, value of 3, and then it would be the next player turn, and then he would roll a dice of the value of 3. The game would freeze because I basically waited for somebody to roll the dice, and then if he rolled the dice, I would block him from rolling again. And the fact that the first player hit a 3, the second player hit a 3, means we have the same value. And on the network side, if the value is the same, even though you say dot value is equal to 3, it won't change because the value hasn't changed, therefore it won't fire an event to everybody. And since it didn't fire that event, everything got stuck. <laughs> and it just like, if you roll the same thing as the last player, the whole game would freeze. Well, not freeze, but yeah, you can't proceed. So to get around this, if you want to force a refresh on all the machine, which maybe is not the best approach, but in this very specific case, I think it's a good approach. Um, even if it's the same value that was in the previous network variable, what you can do is you can call the set dirty and put that to true, just to make sure you have this behavior being triggered. And by doing so, you will have the on change event being fired to everybody. So the turns in Ludo, they are clockwise. You go from 1, 2, 3, 4, player ID 1, 2, 3, 4. However, if player, for example, if player 3 wins, then in that game, you have runner-ups, which would mean that the game keeps being played by the remaining players, which uh, would instead turn a game into turn 1, 2, and 4. You would skip the number 3 because that one has finished and he doesn't need to play anymore. He's already number 1. But what got really confusing to me is that the values weren't 1, 2, and 4. They were instead 0, 2, and 4. And that is because the host is not ID 1. The host is actually ID 0. And then you will skip one ID. That's where the player 1 would have been normally. But then you skip that ID and then you go straight to ID 2. So your list of connected client in ML API goes from 0, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and as many players as you wish. However, you can have a player one if there is no host, if there's just a server. So if you are running a dedicated server, that server will be ID zero, and then the first player to join will be ID one. If you host, meaning that you will be both a server and a client, you completely skip the ID one, which means uh, in my case here, I had to create a circular list and add the ID zero if the person was a host or add the ID one if it's a dedicated server. Now the fifth and final tip for the ML API is actually the blue button just beneath this video. If you hit it, you actually get more tips video, you get more coverage on what I'm doing with this, and it's it's a good value, you know, it's, it's cheap, it's actually quite free. Um, and if you, if you hit it, you get more tips. So this one is really easy, yeah. Go ahead and hit that. I appreciate all of you and I will see you very, very soon with more content and I'll see you also on Sunday where I release this code and where we just polish the game, make it look good, do something with that before we wrap it up. Alright guys, thank you so much, see you soon.